Welcome everybody, I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefield. I got my Fallout 4 Minuteman costumes coat on right here. And what I wanted to do is actually add a little bit of flair to this costume for a sci-fi convention I went to several weeks ago as compared to how I wore it back in Halloween. And for that I came up with an idea that would also work great as a very simple first kind of modeling project for resin printers. So as you, if you watched the video a little while ago, you know that I picked up a Prusa SL1. And that's these buttons I've got right up here. They're actually based on what American Revolutionary War soldiers probably would have worn. Honestly, it might be 18, War of 1812, I couldn't quite tell. But regardless, they're kind of from that early United States period, military period, and they'd make a great addition to a character who probably looted his costume from the Revolutionary War Museum you run into early on in the game. So, with those things out of the way, let's get started with this really cool, simple blender, uh, resin printing based tutorial, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Like 14 times I did that intro. 14 times to hold up 10 fingers. See, that, that's the kind of night it's been. <laughs> now we're inside Blender, and what I've got loaded up here is simply a reference image, a bunch of sketches I made, trying to figure out the basic idea of what I'm creating. Um, so I looked at some images of the Revolutionary War buttons and I kind of, like I said, I tried to figure out what the letters looked like and some of the elements I may be trying to use. In the middle here is the standard USA button with a little bit of a roped kind of look going around the edge. And also because Fallout is set in what was Massachusetts, I may go ahead at some point and try to create some of the Massachusetts Regiment's buttons because, you know, maybe I found that in the wasteland, i.e. I kind of looted this uniform thing from the American Revolution Museum you run into very early on in the game. <laughs> it's just so horrible, so horrible. But anyway, um, so what I'm going to start with today, though, is I'm going to be working primarily on a more of a generalized United States type Revolutionary War button. So for that, I'm going to create a simple cylinder. And then down here in the corner, I want to make 128 vertices, just to give me a little bit of extra um, smoothness to the button. For the radius, now I don't know exactly how large these buttons are, but I've seen pictures of people holding them, and I'm going to make mine be, uh, it's, it, they're probably around an inch in diameter, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, I'm not sure. So my radius is going to be about 12.7. Now 12.7 millimeter radius means you have a diameter of 25.4 millimeters, which is about one inch. The next step is to figure out how I'm gonna create this little rope effect around the outside. If I jump into wireframe mode, I don't have any vertices on the inside to work with, so I need to figure that out first. So for that process, let me jump to the side here. I am gonna duplicate this button, we're gonna move it up, and I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller. So I'm gonna scale it down until this kind of extra area here is the size of the rope decorations that I want. So let me do something like that. I think that looks pretty good right there. Now jump back to the side. I'm going to make this piece really, really tall. So all right, let's go down here, go like that. So now your inside piece is kind of cutting its way through what's going to become the button. So let me click on the button here. We're gonna name it button. And then this guy here I'm gonna call cut out. And now let's do a Boolean operation. And what we're gonna be left with is a simple ring. And I'll explain why that's gonna be useful here in just a moment. So take our button, go over to our modifiers context. We're gonna do a Boolean operation. A difference for the object, choose cut out. Now if I jump back to wireframe mode, that's what I'm expecting to see there. You can see how the button now looks like a ring. Let's hit apply. I am going to just delete the cutout. So now, like I said, we've got this ring here. So we've got to turn this thing back into a solid button. But what that's going to let us do, if we go back to wireframe and go into edit mode, I'm now going to have a ring of vertices that I can work with to make the rope texture. Now here's the, well, somewhat annoying part. Um, what I need to do is delete all these faces on the inside. If I don't, that could make your um, slicer program for your 3D printer kind of cranky. 
it's a 3D math thing. Okay, so let me go back to wireframe mode. I'm just gonna deselect all the outside vertices. So for that, you can do a box select B and use the middle mouse button. And this is gonna let you select large groups of vertices at a time. It's gonna take a, you know, a number of selections to get rid of all of them. Or alternatively, you can press C, which is kind of cursor select and middle mouse button. And then you can just kind of run along here and deselect things. All right, so if we did things right, all you're gonna have is all the inside faces selected. Now this next step is very important. If you do it wrong, you'll mess stuff up. So with these guys selected, press X for delete, but you wanna choose faces. Don't choose vertices, don't choose edge, just choose faces. So now if I go back to solid mode, what you're gonna see is now like all those faces are gone and you've kind of got like a ring that's got the inside cut out. That's good. Now, in order to create this rope effect, what I really need to do if I zoom in here I need to have an edge connecting each of these vertices together. So like the outside vertices to match the inside vertices, I want an edge there. I could do that manually, that is something you can do, but it's kind of a pain. So before I finish building the inside face and all this stuff, let me use some modifiers and some functions to do that right now. So over here, I'm gonna go back to object mode. So over in the modifiers context, I wanna choose triangulate. The default settings are fine, just hit apply. If I go back into edit mode, I've got a whole bunch of triangles running around here. Now the problem is I've got a few too many edges. Like I said, I just want an edge between each of the vertices and not the diagonal ones like this. So in edit mode, we can go up to face in the upper left hand corner here, and we can choose tries the quads. Let me select everything, then choose face tries the quads, and that should, with the default settings, be good enough to turn everything in to what I want, to where now I've got edges connecting each vertice, but I don't have any edges interrupting the faces. So that's awesome. Okay, now we need to finish out by filling out the button. So for that, we gotta create a face in the top and the face in the bottom. So let me select a few vertices here. So I'm gonna jump to the top, go to wireframe mode. I'm gonna select a few of the inside vertices, now, I only wanna have either the top or the bottom selected right now, so I'm gonna deselect the bottom. Go up to select, choose select loops, edge loops, and we've got the top selected. Press F for a face, and do the same thing here for the bottom. And then before I start doing some more fancy editing, I want to make sure all the normals are correct. Once again, this is one of those 3D math things that just is required for your slice not to choke and die. So just hit Shift N, you'll see a little recalculate normals out here. Don't change anything, it's done its work. You probably won't notice anything, oftentimes you don't, but it's like I said, it's a behind the scenes math thing is important to do. To start working on the little rope effect on the outside, what I need to do is just extrude this outside area here with all the little faces. Now it's a little bit tricky to do because if I were to just want to select the outside edges, I can't because I got to select the inside face as well. So let's select the top half of the button and then we're going to use what is the coolest but arguably the most dangerous tool in Blender's toolbox and that's the knife tool over here. And what I need to do is cut straight across this from one vertice on the inside to one vertice on the other side. So I'm going to first hover over this vertice right here. Let's click on it. Press C, which will lock the knife tool into a straight line. And I'm going to go all the way across the face of the button until I hit right there. And then just hit enter. And I've now split this face in half. So now I've got one more thing I have to do with the knife tool. So I've got a line cut across this way, but what I really need is I need a vertice here in the center. Um, you'll see why that's important in a minute. So I'm gonna now make another knife cut straight across the surface in the exact opposite direction, or at least in the perpendicular direction. So I'm gonna create a knife cut across the surface in the perpendicular direction. Once again, starting at that vertice, making sure I go through my center line here and ending exactly on the vertice. It's important you start and finish on exactly on the vertices, otherwise you'll do some weird stuff to your faces. 
All right, so now I actually have a vertex in the center here, <laughs> which means I go back to my box select, I can deselect it, and hey, I've only got the edge ring selected, which is what I wanted to begin with. Let's extrude these guys upward, press E, and I don't know, it doesn't really matter right now. We can, we can change the height later based on what we feel like. But we got this outside edge selected. So for the rope effect, each of these little vertices are kind of on a bit of an angle. So we're right now they're kind of directly, I guess, perpendicular to the center of the circle. They run along the radii of the circle. These lines should not run along the radii of the circle. They should be offset a little bit. And I want to select pretty much the entire top of this thing, but then I got to deselect the outside ring. So just like we did before, let's get out a cursor tool and then right or middle mouse button your way around the circle. Now, oops, there's, we don't want anything selected here on the bottom, so make sure those, that's clean. So all you've got now is basically the inside of the button like that selected. Now very carefully, we want to rotate this. So press R for rotate, and not too far, maybe like that. So now you can see all these little inside lines here. They're kind of angled in a little bit. And this is gonna be a bit of a painful process, but it's something we have to do. I wanna go along the edge here of the button and select every other edge, these little diagonal edges. So we're gonna go up to the upper left-hand corner, switch to edge select mode. I'm gonna left click on this guy. We're gonna skip this one, hold down shift, left click, and just repeat this process selecting every other edge. If you screw up and forget to press shift and just go, oh no, just take control Z, it'll return you back to your previous selection. It's a really nice feature of Blender. So if you screw up along the way here, it's not a big deal. All right, every other edge is selected. We can return to our vertex mode. And I want to move these downward just a little bit. So press G and Z, and let's bring them down. So it's your choice how far you want to move them down. Obviously, the more they go down, the, the deeper your grooves are going to be, but we can always adjust that later. I'm going to do something like that. So we should have a bit of a seesaw shape going on. And now I want to select every vertice along the top here. So let's do that. So now I've got every vertice selected and we're going to do a bevel operation. So press control B and just left click. Um, I find with the beveling, instead of trying to do it with the mouse, it's usually easier just to change numbers over here in the lower left hand corner. I'm gonna do five segments per bevel and just very carefully what you can do is just left click on this little, on the width setting here and just keep clicking on it I'm gonna go back to solid mode. And what you wanna do is get a very rounded, bumpy surface, right? Because that's what this is kind of meant to be. So it's almost like a rope or something like that. Um, but that's what it looks like. I don't know exactly what the button was supposed to be, but I'm just keeping increasing the width. That's a little bit too much. So what you don't wanna have happen is have your vertices start overlapping. If that happens, it's gonna cause all sorts of problems. So if it starts looking weird on the surface here with some of the faces, where you see things overlapping, you've gone too far, pull it back. I think that looks pretty good. Um, let me try the segments go up a bit more. The more segments, you're gonna have a more smoother effect, though at this point we're talking like, you know, millimeter level detail, maybe less. So I don't know, it's up to you how important that is. I like that. So I'm just gonna left click Let's go back to solid mode, or let's go back to object mode, and now you've got something that kind of looks like the button. So here's what I want to do, is I want to bring this effect down so it's a lot closer to the surface of the button. So let's go back into edit mode, and we're going to select this whole top section once again. I'm going to start actually by scaling in the Z direction, making it a little bit more exaggerated and then moving it down in the Z direction so that it's just, the whole effect is just sitting off the button a little bit. And I can just play around with the scaling again a little bit. And it's just a matter of 
making it look like what you think looks pretty good. Um, that's pretty tall, I think. But I don't know, it's easy to come back and change this later on. So I'm just gonna actually make it a little bit less defined and pull it down a bit more. All right, I think that'll be good. Like I said, they can, you can always come back and change this if it doesn't look good when you print it. So now comes the fun part of creating the letters. So what I'm gonna actually do is make these out of curves and turn them into solid objects. So I'm gonna add a curve, a baser curve, and it got dumped somewhere. It's probably right on top of the reference image. Oh, no, there it is. So now I'm gonna move it over my reference image. We're gonna jump into its editing mode. And I'm gonna use this to create the letters. Now a baser curve, how it works is you've got points along the curve and then you've got these handles. And as you can see, play around with these handles, and as you move them around, it adjusts the shape of the curve. It's a matter of just adjusting the points of the curve as well as these handles to trace out the shape that you want. To add another point on the curve, hold down Control and right click. And then, like I said, you gotta just keep adjusting these handles. And eventually, you'll end up with something that you'll, you'll probably like, maybe. So I'm just gonna drop in a couple of points where I think I'm gonna need them. And now let me just adjust things. And you manipulate the handles just like you do any object in Blender. So you can use G to move them around, S to scale them. It's really up to you. you know, it's, it's pretty free form. And what you're mainly interested in is this line. So all these other directional arrows here just kind of tell you the slope of the curve at that point, which may be helpful in this case, not so much, but um, so you can just tab back to object mode if you want to see what your um, letter is looking like. Now, one thing to note about these Revolutionary War buttons is they were hand carved, handmade, and they don't look particularly amazing in terms of their artistic quality just because it was a rather relatively crude process back then compared to what we can do now. So if your lettering doesn't look quite right, don't worry so much. It's actually more historically accurate if you've got a little bit of issues with your button in terms of how it looks than having something that perfectly looks like it was machined by a 3D printer. So just keep that in mind. So our letters are done, but they're still curved. So we gotta do some work with them to make them into something we added the button. So that's what we're gonna do now. Um, the U and the S should be pretty easy. The A could be a little bit interesting, but we'll deal with that in a bit. So all I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna go into edit mode, select everything, and right click and choose subdivide a few times. Um, make sure it doesn't really mess up your curve at all doing that. It looks all right, still kind of a crummy U, but like I said, these are just hand cast buttons. <laughs> hand sculpted, I don't care, it looks fine. Um, that's good. Now what I wanna do, so go click on it. We're gonna go up to object up here. We wanna choose convert to mesh from curve meta surf text. And now if I go ahead and edit, what you're gonna notice is it's now a, um, a mesh instead of a curve. So we're gonna do the same thing for the S. Keep pressing W, because W used to be subdivide in early versions of Blender and now it's not. <laughs> I'm still trying to override 15 years of training or whatever it is that W is subdivide. So let's go back to the U now, because the U is basically an edge. That's why I'm in solid mode. You don't see it filled in because there's no face there, but that's easy. Just press A, select everything, F for face. Same thing for the S. So for the A, select the top half, let's press F. And now we're gonna select like uh, this corner down here. We just gotta build it in multiple faces, that's all. 
Make sure if it's if a area is already part of a face, you don't want that selected. Deselect those vertices, then make the face. And there we go, we should have three solid letters in terms of their faces. Now we gotta make them 3D objects. Once again, we're just gonna jump into edit mode for each one of them. We'll jump to the side and just extrude them up. I don't really care about the width right now. We'll figure that out in a bit. But now we have three 3D letters. Let's scale them in place where I think they should go on the button. In this design, the letters all overlap each other a little bit, and they're all roughly the same size. So it's something like that. But it's really just kind of eyeballing it right at the moment. And if I need to, I can, you can scale them, you know, different axes. Whoops, don't hide anything. So that's not too far off from the reference image I'm looking at for this button. I think that'll look pretty good. So now let's, oh, well that's, <laughs> that's, that's the next step is making sure they're actually part of the button. So I'm going to scale them along the Z axis. I'm going to make them stick up a little bit higher than the little rope design along the edge, but make them all stick up about the same height. And all that really matters in terms of their depth is that they're down inside the top layer of the button, which in this case you can see they all are. The last thing I need to do, I don't know when these things got turned on, at some point I turned them on. Um, <laughs> they weren't there at the start of the video. But the last thing I wanna do is add a little, little back to the button. So that way you can actually sew it on to clothing or attach it to clothing somehow. So let me just, Go to the side view. I'm just gonna add a new cube. Let me scale it up to what I think would look pretty good. We're gonna put it in the right spot for the button and make sure it's embedded in the bottom of the button like that. And now I'm going to bevel down here. So, cause that's like what the buttons usually look like. Let's make this then a little bit more narrow like that, and then I'm gonna punch a hole through it. All right, add a cylinder. That's more or less. <laughs> and one thing when you wanna rotate things to like exact like angles, what I like to do is I rotate them by hand in the general direction. That way I know, you know which value to change over here in the side, and then I update that to the right value. Because depending on how they're angled, you might have to change X, Y, or Z to get it to rotate. It's just easier to rotate it visually and then change the value accordingly. Let's, let's go something like that. Just make sure the um, cylinder is all the way through the edge of this button thing. Well, I don't know what it's called. There's a, there's a certain name for this thing. We'll call it uh, loop. That's probably the wrong name, but then loop cutout. And for this, we're gonna apply a Boolean operation to this loop piece. So once again, we're just gonna do difference, loop cutout, and this should be fairly simple, and that looks right, so let's apply. Let's get rid of this thing, and there we go. That is looking pretty darn cool. The last step before we send this over to our 3D printer slicing program, I'm gonna select all this. We'll select the main button. We're gonna join them together. And the last thing we wanna do, go to edit mode, select everything, and let's do that shift and recalculate normals thing. We're gonna export this guy as an STL. I'm gonna be printing this thing on a Prusa SL1, so I'll be jumping in the Prusa slicer to play with that here in just a minute. Okay, here I am inside the Prusa slicer for the Prusa SL1. Um, usually, with the 3D printing resin stuff, you wanna put it in a kind of an angle, and then I'll just try out a few things and you know, kind of see how, how well I get this thing to print. Let's see here. 
because your general goal with 3D printing a resin object is to minimize the surface area of any given layer. Because what happens is when you use a resin printer, each layer of this is printed on the plastic film that's on the very bottom of the resin tank. So to move to the next layer, the printer has to basically remove that layer from the plastic film. So it becomes a balancing act of the forces of holding the object to the base plate versus it being held in place by the film. If the film wins, your print's going to fail. So by minimizing the surface area of any given layer printed, you're reducing the amount of suction that the film has on the object and therefore it's easier for the printer to remove it from the plastic film. So oftentimes that requires just playing around with supports, trying on different orientations to get something to print right. I need about eight of these. So once I actually get a successful print, I can probably print eight of them at once. But until I get that point figured out, I need to just print one at a time. Um, so let's just generate some supports with a button. The more supports that attach to the bottom, the better. That's going to hide all that messiness up against the costume where you're not going to see it. So all right, let's go ahead and auto generate points and see what happens. Okay, that doesn't look too bad. Um, now let's slice it. And what you want to look for is what they call islands, where you've got a piece of your model that's not attached to either A, another piece of the model that's secured to a support, or it's not attached to a support, one of those two things. So let's keep going up or building supports up. So right there, that orange part is the model. It's pretty well attached to some supports, so it's fine. And it looks like it's going to keep building up off that piece there. So I think we will be all set. Um, same thing. Okay, so up there. Up, yep, up there. You got another island forming. That appears to be attached to a support. All right. So if this print fails, what I probably would do is increase the number of supports some more or maybe even try a different orientation. But anyway, we'll give this a shot and see how it goes. So here we go. This is the completed print right off the SL1 and the CW1 curing cleaning process. So let's clean it up here. For this, I got a couple basic tools. I've got my pair of clippers here from Mr. Games Workshop's brand, but you know, anything works pretty well. And then I've got a basic set of small detail files. First, we'll use the clippers to remove all the supports. This process often leaves a little bit of a mess. You can see that here, there's little, I guess, dots to where the supports are attached to the print. Now we're going to take our file and clean those up a bit by filing them down. What is the ASUS? Oh, USA. Terrible joke, we'll never use that one for sure. Um, now that the support pieces have been removed, we're gonna go ahead and start painting this thing up. And the first step is to use some black primer. It doesn't really matter what type, as long as it bonds decently well with plastic. And here's the button, all primed up in black. To carry on at this point, we need a few basic paints. In fact, we're only gonna be using two, and they're actually called Basics Brand. <laughs> not plan that joke out. Seriously, uh, just a basic, oh goodness. You need a plain gray color, and then you also need a silver color. And that combined, and those two colors combined with the black primers can help sell the fact that it's an old, worn down metal button. For the brush, I'm using a Games Workshop Citadel like vehicle brush or something like that. I don't know, it's called a ba large base brush. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you use here. This is just something I use for painting small things, but there's not any real detail to this process of painting this button, so you don't need anything fancy. Let's start by putting some of the gray paint down on the paper towel and just paint up the button, mostly covering it. Leave some black here and there, but give it a pretty good base of gray. We'll let that dry for a few minutes and then move on to the silver. All right, the paint's in pretty good shape. So I've got a relatively small amount of silver paint on the paper towel. I'm gonna run my brush through it and then I'm going to wipe most of it off again on the paper towel. 
and then I'm going to put my hands in it because that's just how things go. And now very carefully I'm going to run my brush over the button a number of times and that's going to slowly add the silver paint to the raised areas. So you should have something that still looks more or less gray but be a little bit more shiny. And at this point I'm also going to realize I lied to you. I'm going to use a third color. So let me go ahead and get that and we'll be back in just one moment. So let's finish our miniature up here. I keep calling it a miniature, just a button. But I'm going to be using a fairly specialized paint if you're not terribly familiar with miniature painting. Uh, this is Citadel Shades Non-Oil Gloss. It's a wash, but it's also kind of shiny. So it works great to dirty up metal surfaces. So I'm going to apply this pretty much all over the button and let it kind of seep into some of the recessed areas. And it'll give some nice contrast as well as make the button look a little bit more worn down. So let's give that a few minutes to dry and we'll be able to call this button complete. And we'll take two of this, this time with the record button down. And with that, let's call this particular project done. I think this button's going to look pretty good. And it would make a great addition to my coat over here if I didn't already have a complete set of buttons on either side of the jacket. Oh well, having extra pieces for your cosplay, well, that's never a bad thing because these things fall apart because they're janky as hell. All right. Well, if you want to see more videos like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button, like button, notifications, all that stupid YouTube crap. Because, well, it's coming up in the future here. I'm, I'm going to have some more Prusa SL1 tutorials. I think, I think after a month that I finally got it dialed in pretty darn well. I've had two prints succeed with no issues whatsoever the time I'm recording this. I have a third print that should be done in about 30 minutes. That if that works, I'll call it dialed in. If not, uh, I'm kind of back to square one. Anyway, it's been a lot of fun playing with the printer, and I'll be do, definitely doing some more interesting tutorials focused on resin printing. But of course, we'll go back to the old Ultimaker and the FDM printing stuff later on. So, with all that out of the way, thank you guys all for watching. Once again, I'm Jason, and have a great week.